Good morning and welcome. Please look at your bulletins to see the things that are going on in the future here. Of course, today, right after church, we're having our picnic that will be indoors here. Um, so yeah, please stay, and there's plenty of food and um, good fellowship. Uh, the, the only other thing to really highlight is that um, in a couple of weeks will be a big outreach event, our school backpack giveaway. It's always been a big success, and we have a lot of people coming through here. So it's, it's, it's time to start looking. Anytime you go in the stores now, you see all the school supplies on sale. So there's a list in the bulletin of the things that we uh, usually give away. So if you go to the store and you want to participate, um, feel free to pick up some of these things and drop it off at the church. And that is on Saturday, August 6th from 10 to 1, so any time before that, please uh, drop it off at the church. Let's open with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for today, for all that you do for us, for this church where we can come together and worship you. We pray that you would bless this service, that you would be with Pastor Steve as he brings us your word. Help us to put our... Um, our distractions and, and events of our life, our daily lives aside, and to concentrate it on you and to um, apply what we do learn in our daily lives. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Peter. Appreciate that prayer and introduction. And our sanctuary still looks like a construction zone because uh, we're at the mercy of the city of Des Plaines and needing to inspect the window and the wall construction before they will approve it. And uh, so hopefully next Sunday we will be uh, back to a more normal setup. But we're glad you're here. And uh, the baptisms will be after the message, and we're looking forward to that too, folks are going to be baptized and give their testimonies here. Wonderful day for us. Please stand as we begin worshiping the Lord with music. Confess 
is Christ is Lord. Where else can we go, Lord? Where else can we go? You have the words of eternal life. Where else can we go, Lord? Where else can we go? You have the words of eternal life. Show us Christ. Show us Christ. Oh God, reveal your glory through the preaching of your word until every heart confesses Christ is Lord. Amen. Amen. Sing them over again to me wonderful words of life let me more of their beauty see wonderful words of life words of life and beauty teach me faith and duty beautiful words wonderful words wonderful words of life beautiful words Wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Christ the Blessed One gives to all wonderful words of life. Listen well to the loving call, wonderful words of life. All the wonderful story showing us His glory. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Sweetly echo the gospel call, wonderful words of life. Offer pardon and peace to all. Wonderful words of life. Jesus, only Savior, sanctify forever. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Lift 
up your name, for you are holy, sing it again, all honor and glory, in adoration we bow before your throne, in adoration we bow before your challenging days we live in. Recently we were talking about inflation and now I think this week I saw that it's even higher, what 9.1 percent or something like that. It's insane. We have the pandemic, we've got new variants, we've got a monkeypox virus lurking around ready to steal your bananas and I mean this is a crazy time we live in but God is greater than all these things. Would you say amen to that? Amen. He is majestic over all of them. And today we are celebrating how the Holy Spirit is majestic in the lives of two people, overcoming sin, death, and the grave, and calling them out into repentance and faith. And so it's truly a glorious day for us. But another reason it's glorious, sitting right over there next to Connie Williams, is one of our members who's gone through incredible cancer surgery, incredible adversity, but she's back here for the first time this morning in a while. Would you please welcome her? Jalise, we love you. We're so glad to see you today. Truly a day of celebration. And you know, just because we knew you were coming back, we decided to have a cookout. Uh, no, actually, anyway. Uh, but it's truly a great day for our church, and we hope that you can celebrate and sing with us how great is our God. The splendor of the King, clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide, and trembles at his voice and trembles at his voice. How great is our God. Sing with me. How great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our Is our God 
see how great, how great is our God. Can you join with me in telling him that and say, praise God. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. You're singing so well, I hate to cut it off, but we have other things to do. But that was good worship. Reading uh, that uh, one of our people has been, in, I'm not going to mention their name because we don't want to embarrass anybody, uh, but one of our people at least was in the hospital and uh, is out and is feeling much better, I understand, so I'm praising God for that. And uh, by the way, I want to mention uh, the two candidates for baptism, Beatrice and uh, uh, Marlene are, are um, uh, they, Marlene doesn't speak. Did I get your name right? I don't have it in front of me. Marlene? My, what? Merlin. Merlin. Okay. And uh, uh, she doesn't speak much English. Sweet lady. And so when we were talking with her about baptism and stuff, um, Jean did interpretation for us into Creole. So, so shake her hand if you want to or whatever you seem and, and welcome her warmly. But don't be surprised if you, hey, how are you? Where do you live? All these things. And she gives you a blank stare because she probably doesn't. Un and if she spoke to us in Creole, a blank stare is all I could give. And, uh, but we're so glad she's going to be uh, uh, baptized today along with Beatrice. And it's, uh, in fact, because we're going to be using an interpreter for her testimony and things, Beatrice is going to interpret for her. It's really special for me because it reminds me, reminds me of my days back on the mission field and uh, speaking through an interpreter and those kinds of things. So this is truly a special day for me uh, as well, and, and we're glad for that. Well, I'm going to pray for a moment. I will pause for a moment and allow you to mention names of people you want to lift up to the Lord in prayer. Let's bow. Father, well, we are full of joy here this morning. We sense your presence. We sense the joy of your Holy Spirit in this room. Uh, it is palpable. It is real. We thank you that the Holy Spirit is a person. He is here. He is indwelling every one of us who names you as Savior and Lord. And Father, we thank you for his ministry and that you inhabit the praises of your people, your word says. And uh, so, Father, thank you for being here in a powerful, profound way today. Thank you for your word that we will be hearing in just a moment. It is inerrant. It is omnipotent. It is our guide for life and uh, that shows us the way to eternal life. We thank you for that. We thank you for your son, Jesus, for dying on the cross to pay the price for our sin we could never pay to give us hope of heaven, to give us hope in this world that is so messed up, so racked by sin. But Father, there is hope in you. You are greater than anything we struggle with, greater than inflation, monkeypox, COVID, whatever other thing we face. You're greater than all. And so we worship you, we look to you now. Father, we want to intercede uh, continually for the people who've been ill in our congregation. And as I've mentioned, some are recovered and here. And uh, we praise you for that. We pray for George there at Landmark. And we pray you'd continue to speed healing to him and uh, get him moved up to the third floor. I don't think that's happened yet, but we're praying for that earnestly because he got better care there. And, a single room rather than a double, and it was just much better. So we ask that. We desire that for him, Father. And, but bring him back to us soon. We are just not the same congregation without his amens and his input, and especially in the Wednesday night men's small group, uh, we are really missing him. And uh, we pray for Tim Hall this morning, Father, who took a spill on our stairs here yesterday as he came to help set up the baptistry. And I don't see him here this morning, and I hope he's not feeling too badly, but maybe he's got some aches and pains. I just don't know. So he looked okay here yesterday, Father, but sometimes things get worse the next day. So, Father, uh, I know he would be here if he felt up to it. So we lift him up to you, Father. Uh, earnestly, and uh, that he was not seriously injured and, and that he'll feel better real soon. Father, um, we lift up to you our Supreme Court. We pray for their protection, and crazy people have been trying to attack them and 
for some reason their home addresses were leaked out and that is utterly irresponsible and even should be considered criminal I think because there could be a lot of enemies for the decisions they make and people who just want to make a name for themselves there's so many sick people around so we pray for their protection every one of them and uh, uh, we pray you'd give wisdom to our president our government leaders as these are very challenging days to navigate foreign policy and domestic policy alike it's just hard and so we pray for them you've instructed us to do that and so we do that today we pray for our armed forces serving around the world keeping us safe putting their lives on the line so that we can be here and worship in the freedom we enjoy and have enjoyed for over half a century here in our church and and of course more than two centuries for this great country we pray for them and their families at home also paying a high price for their service now father we uh pause to bring other names and people and situations before you that I have not already mentioned. Oh, we brought the dump truck and unloaded it, but you don't have a problem with that. And uh, we thank you, Father. You heard each one of those requests. And I heard Ralph's name mentioned. Yes, one of our people and, and is in the, the care facility and has had COVID. But we thank you that as far as I'm aware, he did not get severe chest congestion or severe symptoms at all. So since he has COPD already, we were very concerned. But thank you, Father, for answering our prayers. And as far as I'm aware, keeping him out of <clears throat> significant illness. So we praise you for that uh, too, Father. And Father, we praise you for these two candidates for baptism. We thank you for their faith, for their boldness, their courage to follow Jesus' example. And we pray that you would bless them spiritually for this bold act of faith and testimony. And that as our services are televised and available to anybody on the internet in the world. And so, Father, we have no idea who's going to see this service, but we pray many will and hear the gospel. And if they aren't uh, already a follower of yours, they would turn to you and those who are followers of Jesus, that they would be encouraged today. It's a great joy to be here. Thank you for everyone who's here, Father. And uh, help us focus now only on you and on what you want to do in our lives as a result of this time in worship. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we have uh, the offering envelope or the plate up here, and there's some envelopes in there, which is wonderful. And uh, Artis is there at the piano, and uh, she's going to play some music for us. So while she does that, if you haven't dropped your connection card, we'd love everybody to fill out a connection card and bring it here. If you're a regular person and you know we already have your contact info, just your name and any prayer request uh, is what we want in your connection card. But please come now, if you haven't already dropped it off, and drop these things off as your act of worship to the Lord. Good morning. Um, let's stand for the reading of the word. Our passage today is can be found on the Pew Bibles and
page 1207, and it's from 1 John chapter 1, verse 1 through 4. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at, and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, we have seen it and testify to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that you may also have fellowship with us, and our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. Here ends the reading of the word. Please be seated. You may be seated. Thank you, Debbie. Well done. Your first time. It's exciting. And we have another person, a new person, who'll be reading scripture in a coming week. I don't remember just when that person is on the schedule, but I was so pleased to see that when Maria, thank you for putting together that schedule. It's an important ministry, and we love to have different people reading scripture, and uh, so that is just great. But I won't tell you who the new person is. You're just going to have to be in suspense and see who that is coming up soon. But I think it's great. Well, today we begin a new series of messages through the book of 1 John. And I've been looking forward to getting into this series uh, ever since I planned it about a year ago. Last summer, as I was on study leave and planning future teaching, and this was one of the series that the Lord laid on my heart to do. And uh, so I'm really glad to be getting into it now. And uh, by the way, if you missed any sermons from the Hosea series and want to catch up, they are all available through our church website, our Facebook page, on my SoundCloud page. You can download them to your computer and, and uh, whatever. So uh, if you want those, we have stopped making CDs because uh, they apparently are going the way of the audio cassette. And uh, I still have audio cassettes and was just using one last week. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, so if you need something on a cassette, whether an old series or a current one, we still have all the equipment, we still use it, and you can always get one if you prefer to have something on a CD. Just let us know and we'll be happy to provide that for you. So uh, the goal of this series on 1 John is to help you develop a more certain Faith, As you see there in the graphic, rock solid, developing a confident faith in uncertain times. And, and uh, it's been a busy weekend and, and not a lot of sleep, so if my voice sounds kind of creaky today, yeah, it, it is creaky today, but a lot of times the longer I preach, the better my voice gets. And so I appreciate your prayers for that, but uh, it is a little bit creaky right now. But I don't have to tell you we live in unstable, uncertain times, do I? If the worldwide COVID-19 pandemic wasn't bad enough, violent crime seems to be increasing at record levels. And, and now we're trying to survive that record-breaking inflation I was mentioning earlier. So whether you've been a Christian 50 years or are just checking out the Christian faith, you're still not sure about it, Friends, I believe this message is a good one for you to hear. The time is right for us to make sure that we have a rock-solid faith. The author of this letter really isn't in <clears throat> much dispute. Pretty much anything you look at in the Bible, you'll find a few different opinions, but, but the vast majority of people agree. Even though his name is not on here, the Apostle John wrote this letter. In fact, all three of them. And the vocabulary is very similar. The style, the format, the content, <clears throat> it all points to, to the Apostle John. And he says one of his main purposes for writing this letter is to help his readers develop a solid faith. <clears throat> Take a look on the screen to 1 John 5.13. We go all the way to the end. John says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have 
eternal life, that you may know that you have eternal life. I talk with many people, and I ask them, do you know what's going to happen when you die? And they get most of them kind of a blank look on their face, like, why would you ask me such a crazy thing? Who can know that? They say, well, I hope so. I, I try to be a good person. I mean, that is by far the most common answer I get, and I bet it's the one you get when you talk to someone who uh, has yet to trust in Jesus. And they think God graves on the curb, that if they're better than their neighbor, well, then certainly God has to take them into heaven and let their neighbor stay behind or whatever is going to happen with them. But God never intended for us to live in anxiety or worry that either we were never saved and going to heaven or that we lost our salvation. John says these things are written that you may know that you have eternal life. And that is good news. Certainty of the absolute most important thing you will ever think about is your eternal destiny. We are pretty confident this letter was written around 90 AD when John was in Ephesus. And they all left Jerusalem there around 67 AD. And, and he ended up in Asia Minor in Ephesus. And it was probably distributed to the churches of Asia Minor. There is a, a map there in the PowerPoint. There you go. And uh, there's Ephesus right in the center. And, uh, but this letter was probably circulated all around that area to all those churches there in what we call Asia Minor. And at this time, the Christian faith was being challenged by a false belief system that came to be known as Gnosticism. Although it was in its very early stages, some people were leaving the churches, and this was causing concern among those who remained faithful. Gnosticism denied that Jesus was fully man and fully God. They, they taught that matter, anything you could touch, inanimate or animate objects, was evil, and that only spirit was good. And this led some people to believe that it didn't matter what you did with your body. Because, hey, that's evil, and you're just going to leave it behind, that old bag of bones, and only your spirit will go into eternity with you. And, and so it doesn't matter what you do with your body. The term we give to that in Bible speak is licentiousness, but that's not important you remember that. But on the other end of the spectrum, there were people that said, oh, yeah, because your body is evil, you've got you've to really beat it and abuse it. And so it gave rise to this idea of asceticism, which meant denying yourself normal things like adequate food and rest and shelter, uh, go out and live in the desert, eating fried worms off a dirty stick. That would be the image of an ascetic because they believed, oh, my body is evil. I need to just neglect it and even almost abuse it. So two extremes this false belief system led people to. But one of the most dangerous aspects of Gnostic belief was that the Spirit of God was not with Jesus until his baptism by John the Baptist. And then before he was crucified, the Spirit left him, went back to God. Gnosticism also taught that salvation wasn't available to anyone who wanted it, but only the people who could get their certain secret knowledge. I don't know if they had a secret handshake or not. Wouldn't that be fun to know? You know, if they, oh, you're one of those, or something like that. I don't know. But it was kind of an arrogant group. And you're either in the group with our knowledge or you're not. And you'll see in this book as we go through it how John refutes these false ideas that were growing in popularity at the end of the first century. And really, Gnosticism flourished from the end of the first century through the second and third centuries A.D. But this letter is very valuable for us too uh, because John's efforts to help the Christians in Asia Minor develop strong faith are just as important for us today because we live in a world you don't ha need me to tell you is increasingly hostile to the Bible as the Word of God and to Christianity.
Today we're looking at just the first four verses of chapter 1, 1 John chapter 1, and we refer to these as the prologue. It kind of sets the agenda for the whole book, and, and they give a broad overview of where John is going. So you saw at the end of the letter, John says his purpose is to help Christians know whether they have eternal life or not. And now here in this prologue, Jen says, John says he's writing this letter. So both John and those who read his letter can have joy. That's what it's, it's so enjoyable to come to this letter. And this is his purpose uh, to give certainty. And that results in joy. You heard John 1, 4 read, and we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. And when he says our, he means his readers and his joy as well. The truth is that if you have eternal life, you will have a joy that nothing can take away. I mean, if the worst thing happens and someone sticks a gun in your face to rob you and they pull the trigger and you die, that's the best day of your life because angels come and escort you right to God's presence. Anybody want to say amen to that? Amen. <laughs> I have to confess that I was checking out our page on Facebook and, and looking at the number of responses something had had. And one thing that's dangerous about Facebook, for me anyway, right at the top of the page, they'll put these little thumbnails for a video clip. You know, they're like 10 seconds long, 30 seconds, and they're, uh, I find them, many of them fascinating. I absolutely do. But this one, I'd never seen this one before. Someone apparently was sitting, a woman, in the passenger seat of the car. And maybe if she was with her husband, he had gotten out and gone into a store. But she's sitting there in her car and has a video camera on. And maybe it was her cell phone. I don't know. But this guy comes up to the driver's door with a long screwdriver. And, and you're watching this video. Think, what is going on? And, and he's got the screwdriver. And, they're, dee, 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 and he's trying to break into the car. When she's sitting there, he didn't see her, the idiot. And so he gets the car door open, and the lady just says, excuse me, and then he runs off like a scared rabbit. It was the coolest thing, and uh, he, got, he got caught. But, but uh, anyway, I know I digress. But I mean, in this kind of day and age, you could be sitting in your car, as happens too often, and someone comes up, and it's not just a foolish teenager uh, but they actually have a gun, and all he had was a screwdriver, but, um, and he was just trying to break in. But uh, this stuff happens. So life is unpredictable. But if you know if the worst is going to happen as we say, if you know exactly what's going to happen to you, you don't have to worry. You can find joy in every day in some way because your eternity is taken care of. It doesn't matter how unstable the world gets. We know where we're going, and God has us right here in the palm of his hand. So here's the main idea we should take away from our time in God's word today. The key to joy is having a close relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Now that's hardly a revelation to a, a person who's been a Christian for a while, but really, I think we need to be reminded of this basic truth that because the enemy wants us to think, well, you know, you would have joy in your life if your marriage was better, if you married a better person, or if you had a better job, if you didn't have a boss like that imbecile that uh, writes your paycheck, or if you didn't look a certain way, if you had better looks, straighter teeth, a smaller waist, a better hairline. I don't know all the things that people get critical about themselves for, or you would have joy if your job just paid better and you could have money to do this or that, or if you grew up in a better family or something like that. We can come to all, if you went, a, went to a church and the pastor had better jokes, oh, amen, you could have joy. And yeah, yeah I heard some of you out there. I'm going to slip something into your potato salad at lunch. But uh, any, just kidding. <laughs> but you realize, right, the one person in your life you never want to offend is your waiter. Right? I mean, because they're going to be, you know, back there behind closed doors with your food. And if you don't want something funky in your food, uh, you know, I'm as nice as I can be to anyone who brings me my food. Because I've heard some horror stories that I hope are not true. <laughs> 
uh, the key to joy is having a close relationship with Jesus Christ. There's no other way. There's no other way. But we tend to forget that truth. We need to be reminded it, reminded of it. I mean, we all know the thrill of buying something, especially now from Amazon, right? You buy it and you'll have it sometimes by the end of the day or the next day. And now, of course, they're doing drone delivery, right? You can have it in an hour. Or how impatient are we becoming, right? But you get that thing, the new pocket fisherman or the new Vegematic for your kitchen or, or whatever. And it's fun for a little bit, right? How long does it take, though, you get that new doohickey, that's the fancy name, and, and uh, within an hour you think, why did I spend money on this, right? I mean, it happens, I know it does, to a lot of us. Or, you know, getting drunk or high, well, that's fun for a little bit or nobody would ever do it, but then you always come down, right? And the consequences can be very costly, criminally, and just financially. How many times have we indulged ourselves in something we shouldn't? We find ourselves wondering, now why did I do that again? I was standing in line at the store this week, and a man was in front of me. Just out of the blue, uh, he turns around and says, you know, this store gave me a free strawberry cake. I said, oh, well, great, congratulations. I mean, what else do you say? He wasn't holding it, so I didn't ask for a piece. And he turns around, and about 10 seconds later, turns around and says, but you know, I really shouldn't have eaten the whole thing. <laughs> I guess that's why he didn't have any to share with me. I don't know, but I just thought that was pretty funny. Regret for indulgence. But friends, I want to ask you, have you found the key to joy? And some people equate joy with happiness. Other people say, oh, no, pastor, that's not right. And they give me all these complicated definitions. Fine. I'm not going to quibble about whether joy is happiness or vice versa. But I found some good things I want to share with you from the world. Zig Ziglar, pretty great guy, I think, popular motivational speaker and author. He said this, money won't make you happy but everybody wants to find out for themselves. <laughs> the one-time richest man in the world, and very eccentric Howard Hughes, you know this, he said, money can't buy happiness, and nobody probably knew that better than he did, as odd as he came to be. Then the actress Bo Derek, remember her? Some of us don't confess that you watched the movie. I haven't, but uh, you know that she was in. I, but anyway... I've seen a few pictures of her, regrettably. But she said, whoever said that money can't buy happiness simply didn't know where to go shopping. <laughs> then uh, that great eminent theologian, Joan Rivers, she said that people say that money isn't the key to happiness, but I always figured if you can have enough money, you can have a key made. That's pretty good, I think. And then there's Johnny Depp. And uh, been in the news a lot, you know, for that trial with Amber Heard. He said this, Money doesn't buy you happiness, but it buys you a big enough yacht to sail right up to it. And now I suppose with an extra, what did he get, 15 million? I, I bet he won't see a dime of it in his pocket, but uh, he can say what he wants to about happiness. But I'm not sure about any of those really. But I am pleased to tell you, that today, everyone hearing this message in person and you watching online, friends, everyone can have the key to joy. And you don't have, have to have all that money to have the key made. God gives it to you and reveals it to you right here. And that's what I hope to show you today. This is great news. So there's three principles about this big idea that the key to joy is having a close relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Three principles. First one is from verses 1 and 2. God revealed himself to us by sending Jesus to us as fully man and fully God. The first thing we should see about this prologue is that John covers the sweep of history of the entire universe in just four verses. Now that's a pretty outstanding accomplishment by itself, 
Then verse 1. Notice right there, <clears throat> he says, that which was from the beginning. That word beginning means the very origin of things. Really, before the universe was even made, before the Big Bang made a sound. Before that, John says, and that's describing Christ before creation. Then if you span, scan ahead to verse 4, <clears throat> John says, we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. The word complete means fulfilled, completely. Uh, there's nothing more you can add to it. It's, it's a finished uh, project, so to speak. Well, so that means from the beginning of creation, and when the joy is complete, that won't happen on this earth because this earth has fallen because of our sin. Uh, so we can't have complete, perfectly fulfilled joy here. We can have a lot of joy here that we're talking about today, but our complete joy won't happen till we're all in heaven and heading for that great banquet table in heaven and we're fighting over who gets the first piece of lutefisk and cream sauce. Yeah, okay. So I know you're going to be running the other way, if I, but there'll be other good things there too. But yeah, yeah. Uh, that, that's when our joy will be complete is when we're in heaven. So John covers the whole scan of the history of the universe from before creation till when we're in heaven right here in these four verses. Now notice as we look deeper into this, that John is piling clauses on top of each other. He says, they heard his voice, they saw him with their eyes, they touched him with their hands. And John uses two different words to describe how they observed Jesus. I think this is so cool, with their eyes. The first word is the common word for seeing something in the Greek language that he wrote in. And, but the unique thing about this verb is that it's in the perfect tense. Okay? Greek is a much more precise language than English. And that's really good that these complicated theological books are written in a language that's really precise. And so what this perfect tense means is that it is a process completed at some time in the past, but it has ongoing impact, ramifications, implications, importance. That's what is phenomenal about what John says there the first time he says, we saw him. And it has changed our lives, if you want to really paraphrase that and fill it out. And he uses the perfect tense for the word heard as well. It happened, yes, in history, but it has ongoing permanent effects. That is so cool he did that. The second word for seeing there describes not just observing something or someone, but studying them with great intensity. It, it's the way... It's the way our dog, Percy, that's his name, we didn't give him the name, but when, when I have my breakfast cereal, my Honey Nut Cheerios, oh, I like Honey Nut Cheerios. Anyway, I'll be sitting there, and I've got the bowl, sitting there in the chair, i got the bowl here, and where do you think his snout is? Right here, you know, and he's pressing down, so I, I know that he's there, and he is studying every move, every Cheerio is under his, his scrutiny. And, and yes, occasionally some escape the bowl, and I don't know where they go, but he seems happy. But anyway, uh, uh, and, and this is the word, though. You're really watching something intensely, or if you've watched those shows that, you know, with the CSI people, they're so popular, and you see them looking with a magnifying glass or a mic. It's that kind of intensity looking at, at the marks, the striations on a bullet or whatever kind of evidence they're looking at. This is the word John uses here. They're scrutinizing. They scrutinized Jesus. They studied him in great depth. The same word was used to describe the women on Easter morning when they came to the empty tomb and they looked at it. That's the word that is used there as well. They, they scrutinized it. And John used it in his gospel in John 1.14 to describe how they beheld the glory of Jesus. And he used it again in John 1.32 to describe how he watched the Holy Spirit descend on Jesus like a dove. Now you know that would capture your attention. 
The same word was used in Acts 1.11 to describe how Jesus looked upward after Jesus ascended to heaven. So this is a strong word, a powerful word of how the apostles said they looked at Jesus. Then, John says, they touched the word with their hands. And this word doesn't just mean you touched the pulpit or you touched your chair or your Bible or your phone. This word means like you're a blind person and you've got your hands along the wall as you walk and you're feeling for the doorway. And it's really, a, a, actually they use the word groping in the, in the lexicons, but it's, a, it's, a, it's an intense touching because it's very important. That's how they're saying they touched Jesus very intently just as how they looked at him and listened to him with great intensity. John used that word in John 20, 27 when he invited doubting Thomas to check the wound in his side and put his fingers in the nail holes of his hands. Can you imagine that? And he also used it again in John 24, 39, when he appeared to the disciples on the shore of Galilee. They were out there fishing, didn't catch anything. And so they call out, and Peter, yeah, Jesus said, yeah, go try the other side of the boat. What a crazy suggestion they did. And the net was full overflowing. And they went in, and Jesus was barbecuing fish for them. How neat would that be? And, and they touched him. That's the same word there. Powerful word. And so Christ who was heard, seen, touched, is this word of life, which means the gospel. This message was available to humans, to you and me today, because God made him manifest, John says. This is an aorist verb, which points to the historical fact of Jesus' incarnation. And notice that John uses this word manifested twice, just in one verse, verse 2 beginning and again at the end he wants to make sure we don't miss it we could not have seen the pre-existent Christ unless God the Father very deliberately revealed him to us that's what John is saying and John goes to these lengths to describe what he and the other disciples experienced as a direct counter against some of this false teaching that was circulating in the churches in those days. And one of those false teachings was by a man named Serinthus, and he denied the virgin birth of Christ. He said, no, Jesus was just born to Joseph and Mary the way every other child has been born. And then he said that at Jesus' baptism, that's when the Spirit of God, uh, that he became the Christ. He was not the Messiah beforehand, but only then. And before Jesus went to the cross, the Spirit of God went back to heaven because you couldn't have this, this flesh and spirit because that was the duality. Flesh was evil, spirit was good. You haven't, couldn't have Jesus be the Christ on the crucifixion. That could not be. That's what Serinthus believed. John is saying it is impossible to distinguish, to distinguish between Jesus, the man, and the Christ, the Messiah. They are one and the same. They are, he is fully God, fully man, and you cannot drive a wedge between the two. But that's what these heretics were doing in these days. John then says this God-man they have powerfully and personally experienced is the one they proclaim. The first word for testify in verse 2 contains the word for martyr. Okay? And that's the word of experience, which if you're martyred, yeah, that's definitely an experience. And that word is in there. And the word for proclaim is a word used to describe someone given authority, a commission to proclaim something. Like we have ambassadors to countries all over the world commissioned by our government. And I suppose you might say specifically the president. That's what John is saying, that Christ qualified the apostles as eyewitnesses, touch witnesses, ear witnesses, if you will. And then he gave them the authoritative commission to share the message of his life, the gospel of Jesus. Oh, uh, I don't agree with everything John Stott believed, but boy, his commentary on 1 John is, is stellar, what I've read of it. I want to share just a little bit of it with you because I just can't keep it in my computer and my study. Take a look at this on your screen. Our author insists that he possesses these necessary credentials. Possessing them, he is very bold. Having heard, seen, and touched the Lord Jesus, he now testifies to him. 
Having received a commission, he proclaims the gospel with authority for the Christian message, I love this, is neither a philosophical speculation nor a tentative suggestion nor a modest contribution to religious thought, but a confident affirmation by those whose experience and commission have qualified them to make it, end quote. I think that's really good writing and very clear explanation. This is what John is doing. Jesus uh, uh, revealed himself to them and then he commissioned them to share the gospel with his readers back then and us today. God, uh, John says this is undeniable truth because he has personally experienced the risen Lord. It's really important that we grasp this truth here. Because Jesus was a real man who lived and died in Palestine approximately 2,000 years ago. He is also the incarnate Son of God, the Messiah. And take a look at what Peter says about this. See the parallels to what John is saying in 1 John. 2 Peter 1, 16 to 21. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory. This, and this was at his baptism. This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mount. Actually, that's a reference to the transfiguration, pardon me. And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Friends, when you read your Bible, you can believe it. Do you believe it? Someone say amen. amen. It is trustworthy. It reveals Christ to us. It is reliable compared to all these other religions that seem to be gaining in popularity. The second principle from this passage is in verse 3. We can only have a right relationship with God and other people through Jesus. I know that's an audacious statement. You might say to me, but Steve, you mean I can't have a right relationship with someone unless they're a Christian or I'm a Christian? When I say right relationship, I mean really righteous and holy and beautiful. And yes, I stand by that statement. It's only in Jesus that we can have the best possible horizontal relationships with people. There is nothing like the bond between two Christians. There is just not. And if people don't share that, you can be great friends. You can love each other. But you can't have that unique bond that comes from the Holy Spirit. So the key thing we should notice in this verse is John is saying their fellowship, their right relationship with God is the basis for their right relationship, their fellowship with John's readers. One leads to the other. Now some of you will know, oh, that's the Greek word koinonia, and that might be the only Greek word you know, uh, next to yiros or something really tasty like that, but, or baklava, boy, yeah, I don't speak Greek much, but I sure like to eat it. And uh, uh, anyway, we studied Greek, but I, the language that they speak now is quite different from what we studied in seminary after 2,000 years. But John says the purpose of sharing the gospel message is to enable people to have a right relationship with God vertically and with each other, both of them. And J Jesus expressed the same desire. Take a look, John 17, in what we call his high priestly prayer, he's praying for us about our relationships, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be even uh, one, even as we are one. Unity, great relationships, right relationships can only happen like that when we are in right relationship with God, and then he gives us the power through the Holy Spirit to be in right relationship with each other. Once more, I couldn't leave John Stott on my computer. Take a look at what he says here about fellowship. This is great. Fellowship is a specifically Christian word and denotes that common participation in the grace of God, the salvation of Christ, and the indwelling spirit, which is the spiritual birthright of all believers. 
It is our common possession of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, which makes us one. So John could not have written that you also may have fellowship with us without adding, and our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ, since our fellowship with each other arises from and depends on our fellowship with God. End quote. I think that is absolutely brilliant how he explains that you can't have one without the other. They are divinely interconnected. The false teachers, they had been disrupting relationships in local churches all over Asia Minor. They were confusing people. People were leaving churches and the faithful who stayed behind, they were nervous saying, what's going on here? Is something wrong with our church? Is something wrong with us? The people are leaving. No, they're being deceived by the enemy and the enemy loves disunity. He loves to sow gossip critical spirits, drive wedges between people. That's the enemy's work. We can only have a right relationship with God and other people through Jesus. It should be obvious that that kind of fellowship that John describes here is far more significant than having a brownie while drinking a cup of moderately good coffee out of a styrofoam cup. That's what a lot of people think. Well, we're having fellowship time now. I've got the brownie or the cookie and the coffee. Well, that's fine. You know, I love both brownies and coffee. I really loathe styrofoam cups. I, I really hate, to, I just think they ruin coffee. I don't know why. But uh, give me any kind of a cup. Paper is much better. But, and we don't even use styrofoam here anymore. And I'm glad for that, as far as I'm aware. And, uh, but Christian fellowship, that is a profoundly spiritual bond between people who've been saved by Jesus and are bound for heaven because of that. Now, I've been around the world. And even in places like Indonesia, uh, where I had very little in common with the people, totally different language and culture, and the average Indonesian doesn't look very Swedish. I'll just uh, leave it at that. And I really was an oddity uh, when I was there. So I, I have a unique sympathy to people who are uh, of a minority race and they're in a, uh, in a majority of the other kind of people. Because I remember when I was in this one village in the jungles of Java, and, and the children would peek in the, the windows of this, this house we were in just to get a glimpse at this guy with the burned out hair. And, uh, you know, it was, uh, they had never seen anybody. And, and they would come up and touch my arms to see if the white would rub off. And, and uh, seriously, they did. And it was, it was a very interesting experience being the minority when I grew up in Minnesota when most people look like me. And, and, uh, uh, but there's something, even with all those differences, when I was with the Christian people from a local church or the missionary uh, was taking me to people, there was an incredibly unique bond between us because even in a grass hut in the deep jungles of Java, we were family and we had the sense that we were family. I'll never forget those experiences. Now, for any word, I don't know if you know this, but there's something called a semantic range. And that means one word can have different nuances of meaning. So the word for fellowship is no exception. And I don't normally do this, but one of the resources I use every week uh, type of re are lexicons. That's just a fancy academic word for dictionary, really. And that might be in Greek or Hebrew, depending on the language that I'm studying at that particular time. And thankfully, I have this wonderful software on my computer. I just right click on a word in the biblical text, Greek or Hebrew, and boom, it opens the door to all these resources and lexicons that I can study and really figure out what a particular word means. And I've never done this before in 31 years. But I want to show you, a lift like a mechanic or a salesman on your car, lifting up the hood of the car to show you what's underneath, because I think you might find it somewhat interesting. Don't be intimidated. But right now, if you'd move to the next slide, this is a picture from Strong's Greek Lexicon, and just don't be intimidated by the numbers and the weird technical language. I've highlighted in red the words I wanted to draw your attention to. Because this is the word for fellowship in the uh, Strong's Greek lexicon. It's one of the shortest, most concise ones, which is why I chose this one. And uh, notice that these, the semantic range of meaning there is represented by the words in red. 
So fellowship, association, community, communion, joint participation, intercourse in that social kind of way. But yes, it could even mean, I guess, if you pressed it, sex, because one of the lexicons did mention marriage in relation to this word. And then on, on the secondary level, B, uh, intercourse, fellowship, intimacy, closeness. Those are all words within the meaning, the range of meaning, the semantic range of this word fellowship. But you don't see anything there about brownies and coffee, do you? <laughs> But that's what we think in America when we think of fellowship. But in John, when he's writing, it means closeness, fellowship, intimacy, that, yes, could be said of a good marriage, those kinds of things. But that's all wrapped up in meaning of this word that John uses for fellowship. The point is that John's goal in writing this letter, he wants the Christians in the local churches there in Asia Minor to have a close relationship, yes, with God, but also with each other. That's the true meaning of fellowship in the bond of the Holy Spirit. When we've been forgiven of all our sin by Jesus on the cross, that should give us the power to then forgive other people when they sin against us. And that's what Jesus prayed for, John 17. And in, in the Lord's Prayer, what does he say? If, if you don't forgive uh, men when they sin against you, your Father won't forgive you. He's saying that, hey, if you don't have a forgiving spirit toward people who've hurt you, that seems to be evidence you've never experienced real forgiveness from God because if God forgave you of all your sin, as massive as that debt is, you should be able to forgive someone who does something relatively minor to you in comparison to your sin. That's the point. Our vertical relationship with God gives us the power to have great, right relationships with other people. That's his point. Last principle is in verse 4. Fellowship with God and other people brings joy. Fellowship with God and other people brings joy. Now, there's a debate about John's worst use of the word our there. Some manuscripts add a letter and it says your... And don't get hung up on that. It really doesn't matter. It means basically the same thing. I think our is more likely. There's some reasons for that. He's talking about common fellowship, and it makes the most sense in the context, I think, to take it as our. But again, your or our, it doesn't really change the meaning. The secret of joy is the unique spiritual fellowship that comes from preaching the gospel of Jesus. That's the ultimate purpose of sharing the gospel, isn't it? Spreading the joy that comes when we are right with God and right with each other. There's sort of a divine progression here in this passage. Think about it for a minute. First, there's the manifestation of Jesus to us from the Father then the proclamation of his message, then the fellowship, followed by the joy that results from these restored relationships. It's a beautiful thing. It's an incredible progression that's right here in John, 1 John 1, 1 to 4. Once again, one last observation from John Stott. Take a look at this. The substance of apostolic proclamation was the historical manifestation of the eternal, its purpose was and is fellowship with one another, which is based on fellowship with the Father and the Son, and which issues in fullness of joy. Fellowship with God and other people brings joy. We know this is true, don't we? I mean, the things that bring us the most abiding joy in our lives are not the things we get from Amazon. Or, or Five Below, or Kohl's, or wherever you like to shop, uh, uh, they really don't bring us that much joy, at least not long term. But it's relationships, right, that give us the greatest capacity. And isn't it broken relationships that give us the greatest capacity for heartbreak? It's all about relationships. That's why it's so vitally important we have a rock-solid faith in God. Getting our relationship with God right will give us the spiritual power to get our human relationships right. The horizontal is vitally linked with the vertical. John's goals for, goal for his readers is that they experience the profound joy and real fellowship with God that people can bring. That's why he writes this profound, challenging letter to the, these churches that were scared with this false teaching going around, people leaving. And that's why 1 John is so valuable for us to study too. It is the key to joy. I have never met a person in my life who if I asked them, Do you, could you use some more joy today? You know, everybody said yes. And John gives us the answer. 
make sure you have good fellowship with God and his people if you want joy. Remember, I promised you the key to joy. Doesn't matter if you win a lawsuit like Johnny Depp or a famous actress like Bo Derek or a comedian, I think she made money, Joan Rivers, I don't know. But it doesn't matter. God has the key for joy and the way to do that right here in a relationship with Jesus Christ. Have you personally trusted from your sin and trusted in Jesus alone, friends? This is the first thing we must do to apply this message and find that key to joy. The second thing is to develop close relationships with other Christians. Make that a high priority in your life. Many of you already do. I'm preaching to the choir, I know. But real fellowship means having close, committed relationships with other brothers where you're vulnerable with each other such as a healthy small group Bible study last Wednesday, right there in our quiet room. It was full of guys going through the previous Sundays, digging deeper. We were laughing and joking and praying and talking and sharing about ourselves. And I tell you, there was a lot of joy in that room. You guys who were there, would you say amen to that? Amen. Yeah, there was. That room was full of joy. And I'm sad for any of you that missed it because it was a great evening and it is true Christian fellowship and it brings joy and today when we go downstairs and have some really good food that some of us had to leave and start getting ready we're grateful they did we are gonna experience you mark my words if you go down there and you don't see people smiling laughing talking in between bites there's gonna be joy there right do you believe that yes absolutely and I wish you that kind of joy the separation caused by the COVID-19 pandemic, man, that resulted in a loss of joy for a whole lot of people, didn't it? And getting together by Zoom and telephone, it's okay, but man, it's not the same, is it? It's even worse when we couldn't gather like this for in-person worship. Friends, I'm full of joy today for seeing all of you folks out here today. Some of you haven't been here for a while, and there's nothing like looking at each of us face to face, I'll tell you. And, and uh, I felt the loneliness that I felt during those months. We were not allowed to have public gatherings. And it was just me staring into the cold, unblinking eye of the video camera. And, you know, three or four or five of you faithful folks, you know how grateful I am for you that, that came to just get our live stream uh, on the air. But those were terribly dark days for me. It, it just was crushing and every pastor I've talked to said the same thing to me because if we're in this job most likely we're kind of people driven people and my wife will tell you that oh, that's my husband he'll talk to anything that breathes and even a few things that don't if he thinks I'm not watching and yeah you heard her say she said amen I do talk to the squirrels and the birds in the backyard and I do I do uh, <laughs> now I suppose you should start to get really concerned if you hear that they talk back if I tell you they talk back but anyway so anyway um, uh, joy comes from relationships that is the key that is what John wants for us what Jesus wants for us and John says when that happens his joy will be complete when he knows his readers are having this kind of joy so we're studying the letter for the same reason so that our joy can be complete and our faith can be rock solid. I think it's going to be a good journey that God is going to bless, not because of me, but because this word is inerrant. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, for the sake of time, I'm not going to pray right now. We'll pray in a moment. But ladies, would you please join me up front? And uh, so, and there, uh, Beatrice is going to give her testimony first. And, and then Marlene will give, give uh, uh, her testimony, and she will interpret for her. So she'll be speaking it in Creole, and, but you'll be able to understand that. And, uh, and after they're done with that, we will walk over there. And uh, welcome, sisters. Anytime you're ready. Oh, you have it all? I asked them to write it out. That's good. I used to go to church with my cousin. While I was in church, they wanted me to get baptized. And I felt I wasn't ready to do that. And I felt pressured. 
So I left church for the same reason that I'm here today. But this time, I am ready to take the commitment. So about two and a half years ago, I was watching a live program on YouTube, and the pastor was uh, preaching, and he made a call for salvation. And then he said, if you have accepted Christ before, and you left for whatever reason, now it's time to come home. So I came home, and I prayed, and here I am today, ready to take publicly to declare my love for Jesus, my salvation. As um, Romans 10, 9, 10 says, if you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. Thank you. Amen. Amen. So go ahead and stay up there so you can translate. And you'll need to stand right next to her so they can pick you up on the microphone. That's great. Bonjour, Benino. She said, God bless you. Moi, je dis bonjour, merci. She said, thank you to God. Je fais que je suis parmi nous aujourd'hui. That she's here today. Moi, je dis bonjour, merci encore. She said, thank you to God again. Il y a deux ans de cela. About two years ago. Que je suis mort. That she was going to die. Bon Dieu ressuscité ma la vie encore. God gave her life. Et depuis lors, moi tu fais un feu avec Bon Dieu. She made a commitment to God. Non, l'homme t'a passé toute péripétie dans la maladie moi. When she was sick, going through all the trials and tribulations. Moi tu dis Bon Dieu, uh, s'il guérit moi, uh, ma balle toute vie. Je sais que God, moi. if you heal me, I will give you my life. Depuis lors, moi prends Jésus. Et d'après expérience moi avec bon Dieu, moi. Since then she gave her life to Christ and for all the experiences that she had with God. Moi, moi vin en mon comme si qui senti que moi uh, de jour en jour bon Dieu a, a m'a pas approché plus de bon Dieu. She felt like every day she's getting closer and closer to God. C'est ça que fait moi dit bon Dieu. La vie, toute la vie, c'est pour me finir tant qu'on crée la caille. So she said to God, all my life, I want to live my life and finish with you like a pencil. Rien pas rien doit séparer moi avec bon Dieu. Nothing should separate me from God. Et me dit bon Dieu, merci encore. And she said thank you to God. Parce que je dis à moi là avec nous. Because she's here today. Et ma de nos l'église, nous va aider me prier. She asked that you help her in prayer. Afin que vous me restez dans pied, bon Dieu, pour me rester la caille. So she can stay with God in Just, that house. Jusqu'à ce que la lui prend la vie, moi. Until she dies. Bon Dieu béni, non. God bless you all. Amen. So watch your step. So we're taking them in alphabetical order. So Beatrice, go right ahead. It's warm, isn't it? Almost too warm. Yeah. So, uh, for after lunch today, we're having a shrimp boil. No, we're not. <laughs> but our heater does work very well. So, Beatrice Beauvoir. Our Lord said, you can put your elbow up there if it's more comfortable. Everyone who shall confess me before men, I will also confess him before my Father who is in heaven. It's Matthew 10.32. I now ask you to confess your faith publicly by answering I do to the following questions. Do you believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, and in the Holy Spirit as co-equal and co-eternal members of the Trinity? If so, say I do. I do. Very good. Do you believe in Christ's death for your sins and his subsequent physical resurrection? 
Very good. Do you confess that your only hope for salvation from sin and eternal punishment is found in your personal trust in Jesus Christ alone? Wonderful. So if you put your arms the way we said, oh, that's right. We have very specific <laughs> protocol for this. Beatrice Beauvoir, I now baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. She's not a swimmer, but you did okay. You did okay. <laughs> I told her if she fought me, she's going down. I'm out here on sturdy ground. She's in a tub of water. <laughs> oh, you did great. You did great. And when Jean was baptized here, was that just a year ago, brother? Two years ago, I didn't have you far enough quite down here, and I think I banged your head on the end of the baptist, but he's okay. Oh, Sister Merlene, please, Matthias, please come. And so she's gone over this. She knows what I'm going to say. And she does speak some English, and so she will, yes, you're, you're right, but you, you can just hang on for a second. And uh, Jean, you, in case I give her any instructions, I want to make sure that she's clear that you can translate for her. But. Okay, so our Lord said, everyone who shall confess me before men, I will also confess him before my Father who's in heaven. I now ask you to confess your faith publicly by answering I do to the following questions. Do you believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, and in the Holy Spirit as co-equal and co-eternal members of the Trinity? Very good. Do you believe in Christ's death for your sins and his subsequent physical resurrection? Very good. Do you confess that your only hope for salvation from sin and eternal punishment is found in your personal trust in Jesus Christ alone? Amen. Wonderful. Okay, now you can put your hands like we... <laughs> okay, on your nose, yeah. Now, do you want to use this on your nose so the water doesn't go in there? Yeah, that's what they're for. Okay, very good. And, and no, okay. So hold your, your, put your, hang on. Put this hand there, and then you hold this on the tissue in your nose. Yeah, okay, very good. Merlene Matthias, I now baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We haven't lost one yet. <laughs> God bless you, sister. And by the way, everyone expresses concern afterwards. My watch is waterproof down to 150 meters or something, so don't worry about that. So please stand and let's sing our last worship song so appropriate for today, Hope in Jesus. Save 
is our only hope. He is our only source of true joy. Father, we thank you for the joy that was demonstrated here in our sanctuary today by these folks being baptized. We pray, Father, that their joy would be obvious to people that they come across now. And when they ask them for their joy, they can tell them they have the joy of the Lord because Sunday they publicly gave testimony of their faith in you and were baptized. Father, Help us all reflect that joy that comes from a vital right relationship with you and a vital right relationship with other people through your Holy Spirit. We give you praise and we pray you would help us apply this message of 1 John 1, 1 to 4 in our lives that people around us will wonder what we've been up to and it's you working in and through us. We give you praise. In Jesus' name, all your people said... Amen. Thank you. Let's go have a wonderful picnic, even if the weather is keeping us inside.